Hello, everyone. Okay, great. I think we're all good. Um, thanks for joining us. It's late afternoon here in London. Uh, my name is Jolie Hawkins. And I work in the education team here at the Photographers Gallery. Um, we're delighted to be here with Shadul Alam today. He will give an insight into 40 plus years of experience as an activist and a photographer. Shadul will be in conversation with Hamad Nassar. After that, we'll move to questions and comments from you. Um, the event will last roughly an hour. This, was, this event was originally meant to take place in person at the gallery. So we're really delighted that we're able to, we're able to hold it online in light of everything. Um, Shahadel's book, The Tide Will Turn, is available from the bookshop. We'll be speaking about it a bit in this discussion. Um, and they, the bookshop has given us a 15% discount code, um, and I'll share it in the comments um, and during the talk. Um, so you'll be able to link to that. Um, Shahadel has been experiencing some connection issues, um, so we do have a few backup plans, if it, um, but, but please bear with us. Um, hopefully it will all be okay. Uh, please note we're recording this, so um, if you do not wish to feature, uh, please turn off your camera. Uh, during the discussion at the end, um, you can either send through your questions to myself um, via the chat feature, or you can raise your hand using the function here on Zoom, um, and I'll unmute you um, and you'll be able to speak directly. Um, we're approaching this event in the same way we do all of our public programmes, which is um, with the aim of creating a forum of trust and mutual respect, so please keep that in mind. I hope today's discussion inspires you and we, we look forward to seeing you again during some of our other planned online activity and, and even more hopefully in person in the gallery. Uh, now to Hamad. Well, thank you very much, Jolie, and thank you, uh, Photographers Gallery, for, um, for your persistence in making sure that you're not going to let a pesky little virus get in the way uh, of holding this event. Um, and I was just reflecting actually with Shahidul that this is not the first time we're share, having to share a, a platform digitally. Um, and, and the first time we did this was about 10 years ago um, in, in London, but then a few years ago in Abu Dhabi. And it's usually, it's visas that cause the problem. Um, but, uh, but it's interesting to see what also the digital enables. Um, and before we start, what we're going to do is um, sort of uh, shuttle back and forth between myself sort of staging a question or a theme and then Shahidul uh, talking to us through with some images. Um, but before we get into that, I thought maybe we start with actually just reflecting on uh, the digital itself um, and, and both the possibilities, but also um, the dangers it presents, and particularly in light of issues of surveillance, um, and given uh, what Shahidul has been experiencing um, over the last few years, maybe we could start with uh, some reflection on 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 that, Shahidul. Yeah, I mean, technology is something that has its uses. Obviously, we introduced email to Bangladesh in the early '90s, so we were very much an exponent of that, but. Uh, once the powerful, uh, at that time, it wasn't the government doing it. We were doing it. We were a small organization. We were doing it as an activist. In fact, using email as a networking tool between southern organizations who would otherwise get marginalized. But today, it's big corporations, it's governments that generally own and control the technology. Uh, and of course, given my recent situation uh, after I got arrested, I now, for instance, don't use a mobile phone anymore because of the fact that I can get tracked. <clears throat> uh, even in conversations like this, I have to be very careful about what I'm able to say in what situation. Uh, there is the Digital Security Act, which is a very draconian law that the Bangladesh government has put in. And while <clears throat> they did say it wasn't going to affect journalists. It's specifically journalists that have been targeted. One of our cor correspondent photographers uh, was picked up on the, well, he disappeared on the 10th of March and uh, 53 days later, he suddenly emerged. Uh, he's been slapped with other cases of being jailed. A couple of days back, four other people were put in jail. Uh, one of them 
uh, very involved in a monitoring cell that we'd set up to, to monitor the government's response to COVID. And of course, monitoring, uh, while the government is happy to monitor, they're not interested in others monitoring them. So at this point in time, uh, they hold the keys, but we are savvy too. I think as, as we are doing now, we find ways around it. Well, using, you know, using that as a helpful starting point, um, I wanted us to start, Shahidul, with um, the request made of, uh, for you to choose three images over the sort of um, 40 plus years of experience that have really meant something to you and, and just walk us through them uh, so that we can see them through your eyes. Yeah, um, the first image is one by a photographer, very well-known photographer from, from the South, Ragurai, the great Indian photographer, tremendous image maker, but it's not so much uh, the quality of his image, though that is also true. I think in this particular image, uh, there are several readings of it. One, the position of the photographer himself, the fact that he is standing behind Indira Gandhi, the most powerful person in India at that time. <clears throat> There is no way a photographer today would have access of this sort. You would be part of a pool, you would be designated places, you would have to stay there. If you took pictures which were not approved, you would lose your place within that pool. So uh, the type of imagery that comes out today is very much stage managed. Uh, it's a credit to Raghu that he was able to create this space for himself that he could take a picture from this particular viewpoint. But it's a greater credit to him that he creates an image which without any captions through the body language alone talks about the power relationships in terms of Indira herself, in terms of the cabinet around her. And even within that cabinet, you can read through the postures of various people where their hierarchy stands. It's, a, in, it's an incredibly powerful political statement made by a very observant photographer who was able to uh, find uh, a different visual means to talk about things which otherwise are often um, uh, quite literal. And so uh, that's one image that has stayed with me and as an example of uh, a photographer developing his own visual language, but also being able to talk about relationships. Photography is very good at photographing what is in front of you. Uh, it's very good at being give, giving literal renditions. It's not as good at translating more amorphous things like relationships. And here is a wonderful example of how a photographer has done that. <clears throat> The next image um, is by a former student of mine, Munir Saman. He's now with AFP. It's, uh, it's a photograph on a boat uh, of Rohingya refugees uh, trying to find shelter. Now, this is the type of imagery that's a lot more known in the sense that so much of photography, particularly of photojournalism, is about uh, wrongs that have been perpetrated, about violence that has taken place, and power itself is uh, a very violent uh, structure. Uh, what for me was very interesting about this picture is he's using a very wide angle lens and he's very close up to the people, particularly, I mean, there's a child sleeping, but even presumably the mother, the other child crouching around and you look at the people bit further away. They're not that far away. The, the wide angle lens exaggerates it. But even from that proximity, not one of them is actually engaging with the photographer. They're far away. The looks are vacant. They're distant. Uh, they're cowering. They're fearful. Uh, and uh, I, I can just imagine the intensity and the trauma that these people are facing, where they just do don't care at this point in time. A photographer there with his lens on your face is not something they could bother with. They 
they have other things on their mind. Uh, of course, Munir is a skillful photographer and he was able to be in a position where he could take this picture inobtrusively. But how un unobtrusive can you be? He's on that boat with them. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm reminded of Solomon's work very early on where he made uh, a point of becoming a fly on the wall of becoming invisible. Uh, in these sort of situations, the photographers are not in a physical sense invisible, but I think it is through the relationship you build with people to the trust you, you're able to hopefully uh, develop and the fact that you're not seen as someone who's threatened, I think allows even in such dire situations, people to be themselves. And in this case, uh, the uh, as um, as uh, I don't know what the word is. I think these are people who despair, who have almost lost hope. Uh, I hope a photographer through. Uh, while it's coming, I'll talk to you about it. I mean, I left home when I was 17. The picture's not come on. It's Ms. Dunn, the vertical black and white picture. Um, I'd left home when I was 17. I was in Britain. Um, I, no, I, if you uh, could go back. I was going to come back home because well, home was where I was always going to come back to. Sorry, so, Haman? You know, that's the right photograph now. Uh, please continue, Shido. Has he gone? Uh, is he there? <clears throat> ah, there he is. I can see you. Can you see me? I can't yeah. hear you. We can see you. Can you hear us? I can hear you very quickly. Yes. Okay. Shall I continue to speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Do you want me to continue yes, speaking? Yes, you can keep speaking. Shaivu, please continue. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, I... I think we're just going to wait. Um, see if he comes back up. I can see you guys. Hear you. Shido? Yeah? You're back. Do you want me to continue? You're on mute, um, I think. Am I muted? No, we can hear you. Yeah, can continue. Carry on speaking. That'd be great. Okay. It's just that I couldn't hear you until now. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, one of the things 
I wanted to do was to get to know my parents. I'd really not known um, known them as adult and adult. Um, I knew it was not going to be easy. I'd lived a very independent life, uh, very different from that of my parents. But it was important to me, and I accepted that it wasn't going to be easy. Uh, the things that made it difficult were not things I was prepared for necessarily. Um, so uh, I'm from a middle class home, and most middle class homes in Bangladesh have home help. Uh, often they're distant relatives from the village or someone who just needs a job, I suppose. Uh, Mizan was this young man who used to work in our house, who used to clean the room where we watched television. Uh, he and my dad both had the same favorite program, uh, Alif Laila, Sindhabad the Sailor. And Mizan would clean the room. Uh, we would sit inside to watch TV. Mizan would also watch it, but he wouldn't watch from inside the room. He would just sit outside the doorway, the open doorway, and watch. Physically, it wasn't much of a distance. But socially and politically, emotionally, it was a huge chasm. Um, I saw this. Uh, this was happening in my own home. I know my parents to be very progressive people, yet they were not able to see this. So I took uh, a photograph of Nisan, and we had very early on in Brick begun to use our calendars for social messages. So we this chair on our calendar, um, and I gave a copy to my mother. I gave a copy to Mizan. The following day, Mizan sat inside that room to watch TV with us. It was uh, a tremendous eye opener for me. I mean, one thinks of the great images, how they changed the world, but that a photograph could have that sort of an impact so close to me, and how we often are blind to what is so close to us for both things that came through. Uh, this actually takes me on to uh, the next set of pictures. Uh, they've not come up yet, so at least I'm not seeing them. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the questions we had was uh, about um, representation. I mean, the reason we set up it was because we were very I'm unsatisfied by the way people from majority world countries were being Our identity was through flood, famine, disasters, and in a modern day context, terrorism. Uh, there are many other stories to talk about uh, which were not being told. And we felt that we needed to tell our stories. I'm reminded of that African So to anyone um, that has joined um, a little bit before, um, after my introduction, uh, Shadow has been experiencing some connection problems. Um, so we're kind of just going to sit tight and, um, and work our way through um, and see if he has got a few devices that he can use. So. Um, while, while we're doing that, I mean, just sort of um, picking up that theme uh, between those two images that he was just discussing, um, the questions that, um, that I'd sort of pose next to him was on the idea that he's talked about several times on and written about, about the idea of photography as a tool um, and, and the images use value as, as a means to project uh, the voice, um, particularly the voices of those who have not been heard. Uh, but sometimes, you know, photographs can be blunt instruments, um, especially when they're competing demands or where what's outside the frame um, is as important, if not more, than what's in the frame, but is not visible. Uh, and the question I've sort of put to, to Shayadul uh, to, is, is to sort of select a couple of images that could perhaps speak to that idea as to what he's learned um, over his years of, of practice as to how one uses this tool of the photographic image well. Mm. 
Now we just need him to come back and, and answer that question for us. So I've just WhatsApped him. Um, I think he's back. Hello. Um, hi. Do you want me to sound and amplify that? Yeah. Can you hear us, Shadow? Oh, sorry. I think I've unmuted. Hold on. Uh, sorry, Hamad. Okay. What were you saying? So while, uh, so while we're waiting for Sh uh, Shahidul um, to, to come back to us, I, I wonder if it's worth just uh, very quickly just pointing out what we're looking at to people um, and then maybe just circling through, cycling through the images and, and hopefully Shahidul will be able to come back and and uh, walk us through them properly. But, but this is a particular project where he's uh, working with teaching photography uh, to young working class kids. Ah, we just have an image. Uh, we have a WhatsApp message from Shahid. Good. Okay. He says he's reconnecting. reconnecting. Okay, <laughs> well, fingers, fingers, fingers and toes crossed. Sorry, Hamad, but you, do you want to maybe, I think that's quite a good idea of maybe yeah. um, you just talk us through some of the images that we, we discussed earlier. Yeah, um, and the, the this particular image is, um, as you can probably tell, is a spread from New York Times. Um, and this relates back to a, a 1991 uh, cyclone in uh, Bangladesh and um, And, oh, we've got a message saying people can't see the photograph. Ah. Great. Thanks everyone for your patience and commitment. We appreciate it. Hopefully we'll be able to have more of a discussion. Oh, someone suggested that it might help if he just cu cuts off his video and just has audio. So we could try that maybe. If he's there at all. Yep, he is here. <laughs> Some, someone said he is, I can see him. Mm -hmm. 
he says he can see, he can see us. Um, maybe I'll turn off his video. Shall I speak? Oh, there, hello. Can you. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so um, what we'd begun to do was to train working class children uh, to do photography. Um, and it was going very well. Uh, at one stage, uh, the children liked the idea so much, they thought we might replicate it, uh, work with others. But we're a small organization. We're not a BRAC or a Grameen, and we can't really scale things up in that way. So what we decided to do was uh, that the children would teach their parents to read and write. Uh, it was a valid exercise in itself. It gave uh, a different standing for the children within their community. And it was their parents were going to get educated in the process. At one stage, the kids wanted bicycles. So you know, I've always wanted a bicycle. I've been riding a bike for 50 years. But um, you know, they, they came up with a rationale. They gave me a cost benefit analysis. You know, uh, they said, you know, you spend so much money regularly for us to come to the agency and travel and whatever. If you bought these bikes over these so many months, we would actually uh, recover the costs and you know you would be saving money. It was a good argument. And I, I could see they wanted bicycles, but darker streets are dangerous. And I didn't really like the idea of them going down the streets without their parents agreeing to it. So um, I said, look, you've got to get permission from your parents. Uh, a couple of days later, Iqbal, by the way, Iqbal now is married to this little girl, Brishti, who's on the bicycle. And Brishti next year hopes to go and begin a PhD in law in London. Um, so... And some of the kids are now my colleagues at the agency. So that's the transformation that's take, taking place. But anyway, uh, Iqbal and Brishti have now gotten married at that time. Uh, he came with a torn piece of paper from his notebook in which his mother had a scrawly writing saying, uh, yes, Iqbal can have his bicycle. You have my permission. This is the first letter she'd ever written. And she'd been taught to write by her son. That piece of paper was the proudest possession that the family had. They framed it, put it up on the wall, and it was there until they had to leave that home and it got lost. But we talk about development, and uh, you know, I'm constantly facing people who talk about target lines, number of people uh, who've been affected, uh, what scale they've gone from where, and all those gradations, and time charts and everything. And I tell them, until you're able to learn the value of that piece of paper, of that letter that Iqbal's mother wrote, you have not understood development. And I think that's one of the things we need to reflect upon. The picture uh, on the right is of a working class kid working, a child uh, working as domestic help. Brishti would have been of a similar age at that time. And at that time, these were the only pictures we'd ever seen of working class people photographing themselves. Uh, and the images were very different. The stories were very different. And in a sense, uh, we were facing those questions ourselves. We had to ask ourselves those hard questions. We like to think that we, uh, by being local, are the people who have the right to tell the stories. But class is a very important issue. Um, and you cannot escape that. On, so one on, of the things on, we were doing, of course, through our photography was to try and turn the thing around. Sorry, Nasser, you, come on. Uh, um, Shaidul, on, just on that, in terms of, you know, what you can and can't escape, I think one of the things is also as to how you've navigated the, um, what is expected uh, from a, a photographer coming from a certain part of the world, in terms of, you know, how you, have managed to um, shape a practice that navigates between what you know what is sometimes called as as poverty porn, um, you know images uh, of, of a certain kind, um, and then you also don't want to be captured by um, you know something which is uh, is aspiring to be of a particular place and 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 you know being pure somehow. Um, so it would be really useful to hear your perspectives on, on how you've managed to carve that uh, path and, and the sort of the bargain you drive between ethics and aesthetics. 
shall we move on to the next picture? Because I think okay. that that yep. will, uh, um, yeah, give you give you uh, a hint. Anyway, it's 1991. We had one of the worst cyclones. Uh, about 140,000 people died. Now, shortly before this, we had been trying to bring down this general who'd taken over my country. So uh, my photojournalism actually began as, as an activist trying to bring down this autocratic general. At that time, we took huge risk to send out pictures to all the leading publications in the world. No one was interested. A democratic struggle in Bangladesh was just not sexy enough. A few months later, I mean, we, we were able to bring the general down. We had an election. We had democratically elected government. Uh, then we had uh, a cyclone. And suddenly the whole world came to us again. Images of cyclone, that fitted, uh, you know, that was what they were familiar with. That's what they wanted. So the New York Times wrote to us, we only just set up Rick. Rick was set up in September 89. This was April 91. We were a very young agency. Uh, the New York Times was a big client. They came to us to say, do you have pictures um, of the floods, of the cyclone? We had pictures of the cyclone, but uh, from our point of view, the pictures that they wanted, and they'd actually sent us samples, were not the pictures uh, that we felt told the right story. They were regurgitating those corpses, the, the horror and everything else, which is part of what it was. But uh, we felt that a different story needed to be told. To be fair, Nancy Lee, who was then the deputy picture editor, came back and said, okay, you tell us what the story is. So we did an entire spread on farmers replanting their uh, fields, on fishermen rebuilding their boats to go out, on uh, social workers, NGO workers, working with the community. The little girl at the top, she, had lost her home, her family, she was an orphan. And I wondered what would happen to this little girl. But very soon after I took the picture, she got taken by another family who basically just adopted her. She, they were just as destitute, but this was a child who didn't have a home and now she had a home. And the generosity of the poor is a story that's often not told, talked about. The resilience, the tenacity of people who can, despite all this, get on with their lives, is, is a very important story that I think often gets left out. Uh, so certainly that was uh, dealing with the New York Times was something we were having to work out, but it was uh, a risk that we took because we risked losing a big client, but we felt we were there for a purpose. And if we moved from that purpose, then having that client didn't really mean very much. Should we go on to the next one? Uh, so this is an extension of that. Uh, women breastfeeding is a very common thing in village, Bangladeshi villages. And uh, really, it's in the courtyard with other people sitting there chatting. There's men, women walking in and out. It's not a big deal. Uh, but obviously, it happens only within a safe space for the people. You know, if they feel it's some other man from outside an unknown, a stranger coming in, then this situation would not be the case. Hassan Saifuddin Chandran, a very fine photographer who took this image, uh, obviously was someone they knew, they trusted, they were familiar with, and he was not a stranger. So, uh, and the kid seems to be loving the milkshake. Uh, but the point really is that a local photographer who's invested in the community who has developed that trust, who has that respect, who's not seen as an outsider, has a very different gaze, has a very different insight, uh, and will get a very different story to what a parachuting photographer who comes in has diarrhea for the first three days and photographs on the third will do. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, I was in a conversation yesterday uh, with Kadir um, in Amsterdam, and there was a Dutch photographer who had just come back from uh, Syria, and he was talking about how difficult it was because they weren't able to get flights and things like that. But he was not raising the question that local photographers were there. They could have been used. And I think part of the problem is that 
a lot of these agencies have not invested in building the relationship with local photographers, in nurturing them and supporting them. Uh, and therefore, when situations like this happens, when Corona comes in and you can no longer fly out your photographers, you're lost because you've lost your link to the community. Which, which takes us um, very neatly onto the sort of the next um, topic for discussion, which was really on this idea of, of infrastructure and, and on the circulation of the image. Now, uh, in many ways, uh, Shaibu, you've been building um, an ecosystem within Bangladesh uh, with Pachala um, as a school, with, uh, with Drick, a, a, an image library and an agency and with Chobi Mela, a festival to try and address these very power imbalances that, uh, that exist in the circulation of the image. Um, could you, it would be great if you could sort of just walk us through um, how you've done that uh, and also how you've managed to, um, to protect uh, against the, the, the possible slippages that your interventions in the system don't themselves become sort of captured by it. They don't themselves become a citadel, citadels of power. Uh, so, uh, this image, it, we were doing a workshop. I mean, at that time, I was very involved with the Bangladesh Photographic Society, which was basically a camera club. They were interested in pretty pictures, awards, contests, horizontal horizons and diagonals and rules of third. Um, I tried to tell them that there was more to photography than pretty pictures. Um, and I began to introduce documentary photography. Uh, a lot of the documentary photography is about relatively well-to-do people photographing the less well-to-do, or certainly the less powerful. We were photographing village life in a place called Sabah, just outside of Dhaka. But we decided rather than to have the show in the gallery, this was done in collaboration with the British Council, uh, we would have the show in the village itself. And we set up this gallery under the banyan tree. Um, and uh, there was a picture of a young man in, in the show who had died uh, before we had the show. But I mean, obviously he was there when he was being photographed. And the family did not have a single image of this man. So this exhibit became their way of finding this person who'd just gone away. And there was a very funny thing. I mean, there were these people on the tree uh, looking into the show. So of course I had to go higher up to the, the tree to take pictures of them looking at the show. And while that's happening, I, I find a little girl badgering everyone because she wants to come in. So I was very curious. So I come down and I'm talking to this girl and she says, yeah, yeah I've got to get into the show. Why? Because my goat has to see the show. Why? Because he's in the show. So there was a picture of the goat in the exhibit. It was very important for this little girl to ensure that her goat got to see this picture. Now, I wonder whether if there, had there been a poem or a, an essay or a, even a song, perhaps, about the goat, whether the child would have been quite so insistent on, on the goat participating. But a photograph was something she felt the goat could relate to. So that was also, for me, very, very important because here is this medium that is so a so ubiquitous but also so um, acceptable to people people feel it is a medium they can relate to it is not something uh, that necessarily is on a museum wall or this very pristine uh, technical thing it is something and now with the mobile phone it's even more so uh, and that uh, um, perhaps the, if we go the, to the next image that continues that that point Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you for that, Ahmad. So when, um, I mean, one, once we had a show, I, my first show was at the Goethe Institute in Dhaka. And at that time, there were very few galleries. There were these cultural spaces. And because I was having a show, I invited people, which included my corporate clients, but also the janitors and the guards and the darwans there. And then later I asked them if they'd gone to see the show. No one had. And I was a bit disappointed. You know, I gave you invites or whatever and then they said would they have let us in and it got me wondering you know the, these galleries are very elitist spaces and in a country in, like Bangladesh where 
you can visibly tell whether the class of a person, at least in those days you could, uh, uh, it's quite possible that the guard at the Goethe Institute would have stopped another working class people from coming in because he would have thought that was his job. Um, so I thought, okay, if they can't come to my gallery, my gallery must go to them. And uh, when we later set up Chobimala, the festival, which now, which was the first festival of photography in Asia and now has become uh, a major event, uh, we absolutely made it a point that not only would our shows be in the gallery walls, but they would go to the marketplaces, to football fields, to school play yards. We put these shows on boats, on uh, bullock carts, and we've even taken to other countries on trucks, on tuk-tuks, on camels, uh, because we find this is a very different way for the people to engage. The next image, please. And perhaps if we can sort of revisit that idea of infrastructure, most uh, you know, literally here, uh, but if you can then reflect on, on, the, on the wider infrastructure you've been building. Absolutely. Well, we had decided we would be based in Dhaka, not in the traditional marketplaces of London, Paris, or New York. But having done so, uh, we were then cut off from the marketplace. So we had to stay relevant. Phone calls were very expensive. Uh, there was no scanning at that time. So uh, we set up Bangladesh's first email network using very simple FidoNet offline technology and whatever. And later on, uh, when because of us, in internet was introduced to Bangladesh, we became an ISP. And we had a satellite dish on our rooftop, uh, a VSAT, which connected to in Intelsat, which was right above. It was a good connection, but it was very, very expensive. Uh, something like $1,500 for a 60 kilobyte connection, not even a megabyte. Uh, so we had to find a solution. Now, there was a cheaper satellite lower down called Aguila 2, the Max Mexican uh, satellite, um, but we couldn't reach it because there was a tree in the way. Now, we weren't going to cut down the tree. So we built this tower, a 100-foot tower, so we could put our satellite dish on top of the tower and peer above the tree to the low cost satellite dish so we could still get affordable technology. But this technology made a difference. Uh, it was what was a lifeline to many people. Taslima Nasreen, when she, she was given the death threats, we were able to contact Article 19, Penn and other people through this network of ours and eventually that helped her uh, get uh, get to safety. And we've used it in many other ways. But of course, it's been the other way around as well, because it also became a threat. Uh, we set up Bangladesh's human rights portal, Bangla Rights, and there was an article published by my partner Renuma and one of our colleagues, Manoj Choudhury, which is very critical of the military. Uh, the following day, all our telephone lines got cut off. Um, so it took us two and a half years to get our telephone lines back, but we were enterprising. We lived in Lalmatia, about 200 meters away. We set up a little microwave dish on top of our flat. We got a point-to-point -point connection from our built from our office to our land uh, to our flat, and we had a telephone line in our flat. So we continued operating, and the government till this day doesn't have a clue how, when all our phone lines were cut off, we were still able to survive. I think that that also um, brings us uh, in, into the next sort of area that I wanted to explore uh, in our discussions. Now, in, in, in the Chinese um, form of moving meditation called Tai Chi, there is a particular exercise that you do with other people. You know, it's, um, it's where it's called pushing hands. And the objective is for practitioners to train their reflexes so that they meet any sort of attack or incoming aggression, not with strength or you know, overt resistance, but, but the kind of softness you know, that they move with the force. So they either they redirect it or allow it to exhaust itself. Um, and just looking and, you know, and just listening in admiration to some of these examples that, uh, that you've been giving, this last one I hadn't heard before, um, find astonishing. Uh, I wonder if pushing hands 
is a useful metaphor for your own engagement with PowerShell. Um, is this what you've been doing? And, and does it get any easier? Well, pushing hands, certainly, but not just hands, I think whole bodies. Uh, but we also walk a tightrope. Uh, one of the challenges with photography is uh, that uh, it is a very fine line between uh, becoming questioning and provocative and challenging the status quo and becoming ineffective. You move too far from that edge and you get burnt and singed. You move too far back and you become ineffective. So what you need to do is walk that very fine line where you feel the heat but don't get burnt. And, it, it's, and that line moves constantly. So the pushing hands uh, metaphor is a good one. Uh, uh, so one of the ways in which we try to do it is being by being bloody good at what we do. Uh, and that actually is a good defense because if your credibility is so high, if you're really so good at what you do, you can't be ignored quite so easily. Now we'd set up the festival uh, and uh, one of the things uh, we were doing was this festival against Dacha and we felt it needed to be recognized. So we invited the president of Bangladesh and he, and he agreed, he came. And this picture is of the president of Bangladesh having a tete-a-tete -tete with possibly uh, the most severe critic of the country uh, and this uh, this exchange is uh, quite surprising. I mean, this is uh, a few years back. Uh, later on, as I said, you, if you don't gauge it, sometimes that tightrope snaps. And uh, uh, I've uh, I've uh, ended up in jail, spent over a hundred days in jail. So that also does happen. But there are those moments when you find yourself on, and you need to be on the top table. If you're to be relevant, then um, I think, um, you know, you have to find ways to be on that top table so your decisions matter. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, if, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them on, but otherwise let's, let's continue. I think we'll sort of, um, we will continue for another five to 10 minutes and then maybe open it up because uh, it, it would be, I think, a shame if we don't actually run through and we have another four images uh, to talk through. Um, and this one, um, I think, connects really well to um, the one where you were just talking um, with, with the president, because you, you seem to be whispering into his ear. Um, and it brings to, to mind this idea of, you know, of language, how, how important language is to shape our worlds. Um, and, you know, working from text to image, I wonder if you could sort of uh, tell us a little bit more about the kind of alternative vocabularies you've been building up in your practice. Yeah, that, the picture you just saw, the paddy field, uh, perhaps we could go back to that, it is a show that I did on something called Crossfire, which is a Bangladesh euphemism for extrajudicial killings. Now the killings, everyone knew about the killings. And I felt showing more bodies was not going to add to, to the debate. But all the killings had taken place in the dead of night. And I worked with a team, my niece Faria Karim, Momina Jalil, and we did extensive research. We found that all the deaths took place in the early hours of the morning. So I took all the photographs at, in those wee hours. What I was also told by family members of the people who've been killed was that the first recollection was torches being shone on their face. So I actually lit every image with torchlight. And these were large, beautiful museum quality images, which in fact then made it to museums and toured. Uh, but the government, of course, closed it down. And then we took the government to court and the government had to defend why they were closing down a show with pictures of paddy fields. And of course, the only way could, they could challenge it was by admitting their culpability, by admitting what was the sinister message behind this, uh, this paddy field. So uh, I actually interviewed the police closing down the show, and I have a wonderful conceptual analysis given by the police to me, which I then use in the show. I've shown it at Tate Modern and other places where I actually turned this thing around and the police is talking about the relevance of this image and what it, why it matters. 
Let's move on to the next one because I think that also relates to it. That is about a, a different situation. This is uh, a show uh, about a woman called Kalpana Chakma, a Pahari woman, indigenous woman who's disappeared by the military on the 12th of June, 96. And many of us have continued working uh, for, towards her justice. And this is a series of photographs I took of portraits of the people who've been championing her cause. But rather than use conventional imagery, uh, what we did was when I interviewed her brother, uh, he told me uh, how in the last altercation she had with her abductor, it was about the military burning their villages. So I decided to use fire to produce fire imagery. Their homes had almost no furniture, just these straw mats. So I decided to use the straw mats as my canvas. And because the garment industry was also very much part of this e inequality that we address, I took a laser device that a garment industry uses, adapted it and developed an algorithm to burn these straw mats. So what you see are charcoal images that have been burnt onto these straw mats. And my reason for doing it this way was earlier on, I had a situation where I found that my work has been decontextualized. And I'd made up my mind that I would not let the politics of my work be separated from my art. So I now try and produce work where just reading the image, entering that image, you're entering the political space itself. Um, so this is, uh, the show was in a dark space. When you walked in, you first smelt the dry grass then you light the candles one by one. So it's very performative as well. And we recited powerful poems written by the Paharis and the audience was asked to read it back, chant along with us. So it was very uh, interactive and performative and people had tears in their, in, in their eyes at this show. And it's, these two have been some of the most powerful shows we've ever had. I think one of the thing that you've managed to pull off Shahidul is, um, is, is not just the fact that you uh, the politics bleeds into the art and vice versa. It's also how you seem to be sort of uh, gliding on time. Um, and I wanted to read just a, three lines uh, from the letter that Arundhati Roy wrote to you while you were in jail. Um, and um, uh, and from, from those lines, you've taken um, the title to your new book, The Tide Will Turn. And I, I quote, I believe the tide will turn, it will, it must. This foolish, short-sighted cruelty will give way to something kinder and more visionary. This particular malaise, this bout of ill health that has engulfed our planet will pass. Now, this is of course being written in one context, but it reads um, perhaps even more resonant uh, in our current context. Um, and I'm sort of in, invite you to perhaps talk a little bit about these last two images and about your book um, with that lens of solidarity. So uh, while I was in jail, um, you know, the people who suffered the most really are my family and my friends. They, they were the ones who were worried about me. They were having to deal with the legal, the medical, the uh, uh, psychological, all the issues that they had to deal with. But while I was inside, uh, I decided to become part of the uh, prisoner fraternity. So I built relationships with them. And one of the things we did was we were able to convince the wardens to let us have paint, paint brushes and paints. And if you were to go inside Keranigon jail, it looks like a museum. There are about 35 giant murals all across. I was in hospital uh, and they came up to me and said, we want one of your pictures. So I managed to get, get in books. So I gave them uh, quite a well-known picture of a sail red sailboat, which has been published in National Geographic and many other places. So when I come out of hospital, on the outer wall of the hospital, inside the jail, is this mural, this 12 foot mural that the prisoners have painted in my honor. And it's still there. You know, this picture of mine has been published in many places, but I've never received uh, an honor of this sort. Um, and this is the way I stay connected with my fellow prisoners. So 
there it is in the book, um, the picture of, of that sale. But this is a photograph of a radio that the prisoners built for me because they said, you're a journalist. You can't be without a radio. Uh, so they made a radio for me in jail uh, for this. But uh, we're running short of time. So, uh, I mean, there is this book. We can talk about it later, perhaps. But I do want to move to the last image because it relates to now. It is uh, about uh, the corona situation. And this picture is uh, taken uh, very shortly after the first uh, corona uh, person, a person, positive person has been identified and there was a lockdown coming up. And I worried about what was going to happen to the average person. A person who does not have a home cannot have home lockdown. And while lockdown can mean dis discomfort to someone like me, to a person who lives from day to day, it means starvation and hunger and perhaps death. And I wrote on the 25th of March about an impending famine, a famine that had previously taken place in 1974 in Bangladesh. And I think we are head, moving headlong towards it now. Yet the powers that be are far more interested in um, what they will do with the money. And in our case, um, we, we set up a, a monitoring cell for how government responded to Corona, and one of the coordinators of that cell has been put in jail. Um, uh, a guy called Lidarul Bhuya was picked up from his home uh, a couple of days back, and now we're told he's in jail. Three other people were in jail, and shortly before that, Shafiqul Islam Kajul, one of our contributors, went missing. So that's the space in which we're living in. But at the end of the day, our job is to highlight the stories of this man out there and the many like him who do not come from this position of privilege. And they're the ones who pay the price for our mistakes. Um, sobering thoughts uh, for us all, I think, to consider. Um, and, and I know um, we're sort of gathering questions from who's uh, still with us. And, and thank you all for, for staying with us while we were experiencing uh, some technical uh, issues. Um, but Shaidal, I wanted to also ask you, um, what are you doing right now in lockdown? Uh, well, I'm not entirely in lockdown because one of the things we do is we go out with food uh, to distribute it because I'm sitting here right now and, you know, you might not be able to hear it, but there are, I can hear the screams of people crying out for food during the day, during the night, well into the night. This is the space in which we're living in. There are people dying. Uh, there are people hungry out there. So while ideally we should have been under lockdown, uh, we do go out as and when we have to. Uh, my, I didn't go today. My partner went out to a protest rally today. Um, they had a human chain to protest against the people who've been picked up. But of course, I'm also taking pictures. Uh, and I'm taking pictures that... I don't always get a chance to take photographs off. I, I take pictures of flowers in our balcony. Uh, I do time-lapse photography. Uh, I go up to the rooftop and photograph the monsoon rains. So those are all things I do. But then uh, I'm not only a photographer. I write, uh, I podcast, I do online interviews. I'm doing what I'm doing like this now. I'm, I'm an activist. So all of that continues, and I think it is important that it continues. Uh, of course, uh, we are having to work from home uh, to a large extent, but uh, we're improvising in that. And in a sense, we have an advantage because uh, the persecution that we've been through has helped us be resilient and be inventive. Um, and challenges are things we face every day. So uh, overcoming them is also part of our lives. Um, and on that, I mean, we've had one question in, and I suppose it relates uh, very closely to the, the times we're living in, which is this idea of, uh, of having that solidarity be recognized of the work that you're doing in taking photographs uh, and then sharing them uh, with, with the world. And part of that is to get the world to take notice. And, and one of the questions that's come in for you 
is, uh, and it's come in from India, is that um, it's very difficult for people to contact um, sort of, uh, you know, picture editors over email because they get sort of thousands of, uh, of approaches. Um, how, how can a sort of a budding young photographer or, you know, photojournalist have their sort of pictures be, be, be noticed or uh, uh, reach out internationally to, um, uh, to news agencies or publishers? Uh, it's not going to be easy. That's the bad news. It's never going to be easy, not just when you're starting up, but even when you're fairly well established, because the power structures uh, are such that they're very much tilted against us, which is also why we set up an agency called Majority World uh, in 2004, specifically to represent uh, photographers from what I call the majority world countries. Uh, um, which some people call the third world or the developing world. Now, um, that isn't, isn't enough in itself. Uh, one of the things we've also done is taken up this um, challenge of uh, confronting the people about their lack of uh, diversity. So uh, we had a seminar at World Press a few years back. Following that, uh, we set up a group called Reclaim Photo which is a network of majority world of uh, agencies for women photographers, uh, agencies for photographers of different sexuality, of Native American photographers of minorities of many form. So we could collectively be a platform through which um, this voice could be said, but that's not in itself enough. I think you in India, we in Bangladesh, we need certainly to work together, uh, that aggregate strength is important. But I think it, taking pictures is a very tiny part of the process. I think that activism, challenging that status quo, challenging that power structure has to be what it is. And the reason why we embrace technology was despite the fact that it, the digital divide remains, we can be nimble. I mean, they have money, they have muscle, we, have, we are agile, we are nimble, we can do guerrilla warfare. Uh, and I think we have to find ways of building those uh, turfs through which we can operate. And uh, I think you being in India, me being here, and we connect with African photographers, with Latin American photographers, uh, and we need to build that strength and perhaps publish together, nurture one another. Uh, and even then it's not gonna be easy, but it's a challenge we need to take up. Um, just on that digital, there's, um, there's a question in, um, uh, here uh, talking about, uh, if, if you will feel that you can talk about it, could you say something about why now the Digital Security Act is being used so extensively against journalists? Firstly, um, no, we, we are in a very repressive space. Um, so uh, they, the, di the Digital Security Act hasn't, been, hasn't just come in. It's been there in other forms. It, it's uh, the Special Powers Act that you've got. And it was Section 57B, which we thought was horrendous and we campaigned against it. The government was going to change that. Hopefully we thought for a better law, but it's turned out to be a more draconian one. And while, when the law was being, when we objected, they said it was not going to be used against journalists. That wasn't what it was intended for. But in fact, it's specifically almost exclusively journalists that it's uh, targeting. And uh, at the moment, the government has full spectrum control. Uh, you know, they have the controller, the judiciary is no longer independent. You, uh, they have the police it's not an elected government, so they don't even need the public anymore. Uh, our votes do not matter. So the only thing they have to defend is their credibility. And journalists are challenging that credibility. And today, particularly in this situation when people are talking about their lack of effective action against Corona, the fact that ruling party people are stealing the rice for the poor and their stories are coming up every day, rather than address those issues, they feel the way to counter it is by shutting us down. And because there's 
digital technology because mainstream media has also abdicated it with some notable exceptions. Uh, mainstream media is not doing what it's meant to be doing, partly out of fear, partly out of convenience, uh, and because they're not pushing sufficiently. Social media has become the space. Uh, and even, uh, even established journalists are turning to social media to get their message out. And that now is the government's concern. So uh, they will block any space there is. Uh, and they're tightening the noose. Um, and uh, slowly um, they're turning the screw. But I will talk about the tide will turn because I think despite that, people are protesting, voices are coming out, and both physically and online. And I think uh, they will not be able to shut us down. Uh, uh, I think that collective strength that we have is our resilience, and we will try. Um, Shahidul, um, there's a question here, and I suppose it also uh, works to uh, the experience that perhaps you had when in, in the campaign to free Shahidul that was sort of uh, going viral all over the world uh, at a time when you could say a viral. Um, I, I feel like I've just committed a faux pas. Um, but uh, the, the, and there's a question about the local versus the non-local or the international. And you know, you've, you've um, in your arguments and in, in your career, you've made a, you know, consistently a strong argument for the local. But what are the advantages to not being local? And what does sort of not being local allow um, that, uh, that is uh, curtailed to you from being local? They are two different spaces. Uh, and I think certainly, uh, the fear um, that we live in is um, very real. The fact that I don't use a mobile phone, the fact that I, despite having cycled for 50 years, I don't go on a bicycle anymore, and the fact that I have to stay in touch and that we're in constant alert is a reality uh, of living here. Uh, that is something that people outside can overcome. Tasnim Khalil, uh, who is in Sweden running Netra News, uh, is bringing out a very important publication, which incidentally is blocked in Bangladesh. But, uh, and there are many other people doing very, very important work in the diaspora. And at a time like this, there are people who are sending in money for the poor and for us to uh, help use in our relief work and things like that. But I think there is a price to be paid. One is that you don't feel the pulse, uh, that you're not... Uh, in the streets, smelling the tear gas, smelling what's happening. And therefore, in a sense, sometimes your arguments can be a little bit aloof, a little bit theoretical, a little bit out of touch. Uh, but I think both are needed. Uh, and together, uh, things can happen. Uh, I use being local in a different way. I, I, friends of mine have been telling me for a long, long time to leave the country to be in exile. For me, that's a no-no. If I, my community is here, I have to be here. I have no problems accepting that there are people who feel they simply cannot live in this oppressive space and need to get out and breathe. Um, I wouldn't be able to do it. One of the things I've insisted and also upon doing is keeping my Bangladeshi passport. Now, a Bangladeshi needs a visa to go to the toilet. Uh, traveling internationally is horrendous on a Bangladeshi passport. For me, it's a very important thing because I'm confronted with what a, an average Bangladeshi, I'm not saying I'm an average Bangladeshi, I'm very privileged. The fact that I don't have to worry about whether I'll have breakfast tomorrow morning or food tomorrow makes me a privileged person. So I'm not pretending I'm um, a working class, but the fact that a Bangladeshi passport uh, makes life traveling and a whole lot of other things so difficult is something that I'm confronted with every time I travel. And I find that very important because it is very easy to get dislocated from that reality. And that is one risk that you do take when you're outside. And I think if you're outside, you really need to work that much harder to ensure that your finger is on the pulse. Um, on that sort of note, um, I, I think we've uh, 
uh, we, we really want to sort of uh, thank you, Shahidul, for taking the time um, and uh, bearing with us. And then we've sort of gone over our, our allocated time limit. Um, also wanted to uh, thank everybody who stayed uh, with us on, um, on, on the Zoom or webinar or wherever you're, you're consuming this. Um, and, uh, and to leave uh, that Shahidul uh, view with the message that Shahidul's book, The Tide Will Turn, is uh, available from the Photographer's Gallery Bookshop. There it is. Uh, and, yeah. and, and you're able to, um, <laughs> uh, to, to get it. And I'll sort of pass over to, 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 to Jodie. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, thank you everybody for um, for sticking with us. It was classic technical um, glitch there. Um, but I have put the discount code um, in the chat um, as well as the link um, so you can directly go to that. Um, and also, if you have a moment, we'd love to hear what you thought of the event. So please um, complete a poll. I'm going to post it now. Um, it should take about 30 seconds, so not long. Um, thank you for joining us tonight and we hope to see you again um, during some of our other planned activity um, and then yeah back in the gallery in person um, hopefully sooner rather than later so thank you all for joining and thanks Shahadul thank you thank you so much Hamad thanks Ross. and thanks Hamad thank you Hamad thank you a pleasure Jolie, the poll's not working for me. Oh, is it? Is it not? Uh, I don't know it, why. Someone's. Oh, using okay. Okay. <laughs>